and it's beautiful to be here with you today. I want you to take your Bibles open to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, and uh, we're going to look at verse 11. And this morning, I want to preach on this topic, seeing Jesus, seeing Jesus. How do you see Jesus? Did you know seeing Jesus is a matter of life and death? My job as a pastor is to come and just give you the scripture so that you can see Jesus in the scripture. That's what I try to do. In fact, there's a sign here on this pulpit. It was put here by Pastor Johnson. I see it every time I walk up into the pulpit. It says here on the front, sir, we would see Jesus. Pastor put that there many years ago. It's a reminder to any preacher that comes to the pulpit that our major responsibility is to show forth Christ and to speak of Christ. And so it's a wonderful experience when we see the beauty of Christ in Scripture. And according to Jesus and according to this passage, to see him otherwise can be very damaging. You can align yourself with Satan if you don't properly see the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a matter of eternal consequence. It's a matter of life and death. So how do you see the Lord Jesus? Everybody sees Jesus one way or another. Every religion does. Every social commentator does. Every theologian does. Every scholar does. But the question is, how do you see him? You know, just imagine you've come home from a wedding and you get a little bored. So you log on to Facebook and discover that a friend has uploaded a number of photos from that very wedding. And so you begin to look through those photos and be honest. What are you looking for? You're looking for yourself, right? Pictures of yourself. Well, what I want to show you today are just some pictures here in this gospel chapter, chapter eight. And I want you to see if you see yourself in any of these pictures. That's what I want you to see. And I want you to see five pictures depicting a different way of seeing Jesus that has eternal consequences. And so here's the first one. The first picture I call defiance. Some people see Jesus like the Pharisees did. Look in Mark chapter eight, look in verse 11. Uh, Actually, back up to verse 10, we'll get a little context. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came into the parts of Dalmunatha, that is really uh, Magdalene, that area there. And verse 11, and the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven and tempting him. Now you remember that Jesus is in this region of the Sea of Galilee. He had taken a journey north into the north region up at Tyre and Sidon, and then he came down southwest into this region of the Decapolis, and there he did the miracle of feeding the 4,000. We saw that last week. He repeated the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. He does it this time with 4,000 for the Gentiles to communicate the message that Jesus is the bread of life for everyone. He's the universal Savior. And immediately right after that, the Bible says he gets into a ship, and now he comes to, he crosses the Sea of Galilee, And now he comes back into Jewish territory. And as he gets off the boat, he's immediately confronted by his enemies, we could say. Because verse 11 says, and the Pharisees came forth. Now, if you look at Matthew's description of this, his parallel account, it says the Pharisees and the Sadducees came. And that's interesting to me because what are these two groups going doing together? They were strange bedfellows, you could say. The Pharisees were strict Uh, legalists. They were separatists. They held to an orthodox view of scripture. The Sadducees were more liberals. They didn't believe in miracles. They uh, were really the opposite end of the spectrum. In fact, the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees couldn't even get along. In one place in Acts chapter 23, they're at each other's throats. But here they're together. This would be like the Republicans and the Democrats getting together here. Here they're together. What brought them together? It was their hatred and opposition of Christ. They wanted to trip up the Lord. It says in verse 11, they came tempting him or really to test him. This was not a test to discern the truth as to whether or not he was really from God. Really, it was trying to trip him up, to find a reason to use against him, to keep other people from believing in him. The Bible already says that they already rendered a judgment on him. In Mark chapter 3, they said he does miracles in the power of Satan. They've already rendered a judgment against Jesus. So really, this is like Israel tempting God in the wilderness. It's born not out of belief, but it's born out of unbelief. And this kind of testing 
provokes God to anger. They weren't coming to Jesus because they had honest doubts about who he was and they wanted truth. They were dishonest doubters. Remember, I told you there's a difference between honest doubters and dishonest doubters. An honest doubter is really seeking the truth. And for someone like that, God will give them the truth. But a dishonest doubter is not seeking truth. They're actually running away from truth. They are suppressing the truth. And this is what these Pharisees are. They are pushing away the truth. They knew who he was. They were at the public events where Jesus performed miracles. In fact, if you go through the New Testament and you look at the miracles of Jesus, in almost every account, you'll see the Pharisees standing somewhere in the background watching. They saw what he had done. They saw his miracles that he performed. But notice what they ask him in verse number 11. They, they began to seek, seeking of him, it says in verse 11, a sign from heaven. Lord, give us a sign. Give us a sign from heaven of who you are. It took a lot of nerve on their part to ask this. Jesus had already performed many miracles. And here they are asking for another sign. What they were essentially saying is, none of the miracles that you have done up to this point do we consider to be legitimate. We want a real miracle from heaven or literally out of heaven. The Jews had this superstition that miracles that are done on the earth could be done by demons. But miracles out of heaven, that was really of God. So they're saying, give us a miracle out of heaven. After all, in the Old Testament, prophets did miraculous signs from the heaven. Joshua caused the sun to stand, to stand still. Elijah called down fire from heaven. Samuel rained down thunder from heaven. We want you to do the same. We want a miracle from heaven. And by the way, didn't they, weren't, didn't they understand that at his birth there was a miracle from heaven? The whole sky was filled with glory. But they discounted all of that. They really didn't need another sign. They had all the evidence that they required. The problem is, was their heart. And really the request is a sin. Voltaire, the French atheist, said this. He said, even if a miracle should be wrought in the open marketplace before a thousand sober witnesses, I would rather mistrust my senses than admit a miracle. And that's what the attitude of these Pharisees was. You have a whole generation of Voltaires in Israel that will not believe. He's looking for another sign. And what, did you, what was Jesus' response in verse 11? Look at verse, uh, verse 12, rather. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall be no sign given unto this generation. Notice where it says he sighed deeply to draw a deep breath from the bottom of his chest. Here it has the idea of lamenting, of sorrow. This broke the heart of Jesus. It wounded his soul. That here is this generation that saw already so many miracles, and yet still they would not believe. And this Request of a sign was totally inappropriate. And Jesus said, I'm not going to give you any more signs. But if you read the parallel account in Matthew, he, it goes on to say, I'm not going to give you any more signs except for one in the future, which is the sign of Jonah, the prophet, because as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the son of man be in the heart of the earth. In other words, he's basically saying, I'm not going to give you a new sign. I'm going to point back to an old sign. If you want to know that I'm really the Messiah, you just wait. What was he talking about? The resurrection. The resurrection will show who I am. But they re he refused to give him any more. In fact, he condemned that generation. He called them a wicked and adulterous generation who seeks after a sign. And uh, so it says in verse number 13, notice verse 13, his departure. And he left them and entered into a ship and departed to the other side. Jesus just turned and left them. He departed. There was nothing more to say, nothing more that needed to be done. He wasn't going to do any more tricks for them to try to uh, persuade them because they had already made up their mind. They were not looking for the truth for the same reason a crook doesn't look for a policeman. They don't want to be under his authority. And so Jesus just turns away from them. He left them to their own ways. By the way, that's a judgment from God. When God turns you over to yourself, when God leaves you alone and says, I'm done with you, that is a severe judgment. And this is what he does. He gave them over. In fact, later on in, in, in the gospel of Matthew, when the disciples tried to speak to the Pharisees, Jesus said, look, just leave them alone. Leave them alone. 
it, 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 it's over with them. We don't want to get to that point. So some see Jesus like the Pharisees. They will not believe. It's stubborn unbelief. It's defiance. But then secondly, I want you to see this next picture. Some see Jesus like the disciples. It's doubt. Look in verse number 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them um, more than one loaf. And he charged them saying, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves saying, is it because we have no bread? This is a kind of a comical narrative here. They get into the boat. The Bible says they had one loaf of bread. They're going across the Sea of Galilee. This confrontation that Jesus had with the Pharisees and Sadducees is still fresh on his mind. And so Jesus gives a warning, but in doing so, he kind of uses a metaphor. Look again in verse 15. He charged them uh, saying, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Take heed is for word means uh, take special attention Special notice, beware, watch out. So this is a warning from Jesus. Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, leaven there in the scripture, leaven is used as a symbol of an evil influence. Because what is leaven? Back in this day, when a woman would bake bread, she would take the dough and she would take a little pinch of it and put it aside. She would leave that overnight and that would ferment. That would become leaven. On the next day's batch, she would place that leaven in the dough and it would spread all throughout and call the, cause the bread to rise. That little bit of leaven would leaven the whole lump, as it were. It would spread and permeate throughout the loaf. And that l- bit of leaven symbolized the spread of evil or the influence of something bad. And Jesus is using a metaphor here to talk about the evil influence of the Pharisees and of Herod. Their teaching. What specifically was the leaven of the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees didn't believe in who Jesus was. And Herod was opposing Jesus. And so their teaching was spreading throughout. In fact, many people didn't believe on Jesus because of some of the lies that the Pharisees and Herod had spread about Jesus. It was affecting people. And so Jesus was giving a warning. You better watch out for the leaven. Later on, Paul would say a little leaven leavens the whole lump this was an attitude of unbelief towards the divine christ the messiah and so jesus gives them this warning now the disciples they just didn't get it there's no other way to say it you ever just teach someone and they just don't get it they just don't because look in verse 16 and they reasoned among themselves saying is it because we have no bread i mean they kind of Put it in this day's vernacular. They're like, what's what's with Jesus? Is he mad at us because we didn't bring more bread on the on this journey? Because we only have one loaf. Is he, he's talking about bread? And this was totally they totally missed it. They totally didn't get it. And look at verse 17. And Jesus knew it. And he said unto them, why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet? Neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not, and having ears, hear ye not? Do ye not remember? Look at verse 19. When I break the five loaves among the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, 12. And when the seven among 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, how is it that ye do not understand? Guys, do you really think I'm worried about bread? Do you really think I'm worried because we only got one loaf? Don't you remember what you just saw? Do you remember how I fed the 5,000 with five loaves and the 4,000 with seven loaves and you even took up fragments? Do you really think I'm worried about bread? Do you, are you still not getting this? Is it because of the hardness of your heart that you don't understand what I'm trying to say? And what the problem here with the disciples is, is that they were still wrestling in their own heart about who Jesus is. They were still wrestling with doubts. And in some manner and form, those doubts were hindering them from seeing spiritual truth the way the Lord wanted them to. You see, they still had not come to a complete understanding, a decisive understanding about who Jesus really was. 
And so Jesus calls this hardness of heart. It's not hardness in the same way that the Pharisees were hardness. It just means that they were slow to understand and embrace the truth. Perhaps you claim to be a follower of Christ and maybe you're still wrestling with doubts about Jesus. Maybe you are wondering if Jesus can really do something for you that you need done in your life. You're wrestling about his sufficiency for you and your own life. Some people see Jesus like the disciples. And so we see the picture of defiance. We see the picture of doubt. But here's the third picture I want you to see. Deliberation. Some people see Jesus like ordinary people. Drop down to verse number 27 of Mark chapter 8. And this is a little bit later on. Look at verse 27. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some said Elias, and others, one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And so Jesus uh, comes to the disciples at this one place at Caesarea Philippi. And he asked this one question, how do people see me? Who do they say that I am? And the answer that was given by the disciples was, well, well, some people see you as John the Baptist come again. Remember, at this point, John the Baptist had already died. He was beheaded by Herod, and some saw Jesus as the second coming of John the Baptist. Others saw him as Elijah the prophet who came back from the dead. And so, in essence, they were saying, people see you as another prophet, a great prophet, which they were deliberating about Jesus. Many of the people that were there and saw his ministry were still deliberating about who he was. And this might sound like a very nice thing. It might sound like a polite thing to say, well, Jesus is a prophet. But really, it's an insult because I want to tell you, friend, Jesus claimed to be more than a prophet. He claimed to be the son of God. He claimed to be God in the flesh. And you really can't say then that he was a good prophet because a good prophet, if he's not the son of God, he's lying. It goes back to what C.S. Lewis said. Some of these people give this these answers, oh, he was a good moral teacher. Listen, that option is not held out to you. He can't be a good moral teacher because he claimed to be God. And if he wasn't God, then he's lying. C.S. Lewis said Jesus was either crazy, he was a lunatic, or he was a liar, or he was Lord. That's the only three options you have there. But you can't say that he was some good prophet or that he was some moral teacher because that option is really not left out to us because of the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 14, he said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. And so, you have to see Jesus as who he is. These people didn't see him as he was. They only found, uh, they only uh, could see him as a prophet. But this is a big, important question. A very important question. And Jesus makes it even more personal. And by the way, there are still some people today ordinary people that when you ask them about Jesus, they're still deliberating. They're still trying to come up with some kind of nonsense because they don't want to say that he is God or is the Messiah or he is the Christ. They would rather try to give these polite uh, titles to Jesus. But again, that option is not left open to them. They're deliberating. But then I want you to see another picture. I call this development. Some see Jesus like the blind man Jesus healed. And what I want you to see is look at verse 22 of Mark chapter 8, because we have a really incredible story here. This is a story that's placed right in the middle of the other incidents, right here in the middle of Mark chapter 8. And it's about Jesus healing the blind man. Look at verse 22. And when he come to Bethsaida, they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes... And put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and he said, I see men as trees walking. Verse 25, and after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he, and he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. And so here we have this two tempt. Uh, two attempts of healing this blind man. It's a very interesting story. This is the only time in the New Testament when Jesus performed a miraculous work of healing that didn't happen immediately. 
This is a two-staged uh, miracle, we could say, or a two-step miracle. And so the question that we want to ask here is, what's going on here? How come Jesus couldn't heal the man on the first touch? I mean, was Jesus tired that night? Was he off on his healing game at this point in his ministry? Of course not. Understand this, beloved, that every miracle that Jesus did was an object lesson. It taught a spiritual truth. And Jesus here is actually, I think Mark has it positioned here in the narrative and between these two other stories to teach a spiritual truth. And uh, this, this is, and what is the spiritual truth that he's trying to teach us here? Is that sometimes for some people, seeing who Jesus really is, having your eyes opened is a gradual process. Maybe it doesn't happen all at once. Maybe it takes a little bit more, a gradual illumination of when a person's eyes is finally opened and they gradually begin to see more clearly, more clearly who Jesus is. You know, in the gymnasium uh, down here, we have, we have uh, lights that when you flip the switch, the lights don't just come on like here in the auditorium. If you flip the switch, what will happen is they'll come on real dim and then you'll hear this buzzing and then they'll get, it'll get a little bit brighter, a little bit brighter. It takes about 10 minutes for them to fully get bright. Very irritating. They don't just come on. They just gradually come on. It's a process. And I think about that when I see this story here. For some people, even when they're touched by the Lord, they still don't see at the beginning all things clearly about him. But it's a gradual process. We know that all are born in darkness. Do you understand that, right? Every person born is born in spiritual darkness. That's our natural condition. The Bible says the God of this world has blinded the minds. And then at salvation, God removes the blindness and he shines the light. Write down 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. So at salvation, God, he opens our eyes. He gives us light. By the way, there are some people who are religious. They're not really saved. They claim to be saved, but they still don't see Christ. They're still blind. That's why Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, leave them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. They're religious. They think they got it, but they don't. They're still in their blindness. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. There are some people that are just like that. But even when people are converted to Christ, they're still growing in their ability to see Jesus. J.C. Ryle said this. Listen to what he said. Conversion is an illumination, a change from the darkness to light, from blindness to seeing the, the kingdom of God. Yet few converted people see things distinctly at first. The nature and proportion of doctrine and practices of the gospel are dimly seen by them and imperfectly understood. And he's right. When we're converted, uh, we do get the, our lights. Uh, the light is turned on, but there's still kind of a dimness there. And we have to grow more and more into seeing Jesus for who he really is. That's called spiritual growth, beloved. That's why when we come, we try to show you Jesus Christ more and more in the scripture. Why? Because the Bible says we are to grow, 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then also 2 Corinthians 3.18, listen to this verse. But we all with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know what he's saying there? Here's the, here's the glass. This is, this is what reflects the glory of Christ. That's why when you come to church, beloved, what I do is I try to show you Jesus here in this book. And you see images of Jesus. You see the glory of Christ. And as you grow more, you see more and more of his glory. And as you see that glory, your eyes are opened even more. And you begin to see more of the clarity and the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? That's spiritual growth. That's growing into the things of God. And this is what is happening to the disciples. They're wrestling about who Jesus is. But it all leads up. Look at verse 29. This one event, this is really the center of the whole narrative. Look at verse 29. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Who do you say I am? 
That's the question. Not what other people think, but who do you? And the you there is plural. He's talking to the disciples. Who do you say that I am? And that's the question for you today. Who do you say Jesus is? That's what he wants to know. That's the unavoidable question. And Peter gives a, one of the greatest answers in all of redemptive history. Look at verse 29. But Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ. The Christ. Man, he got it exactly right. In just that moment of time, he got some divine illumination. And he was the spokesman for the disciples. He's speaking for all of them. They finally get to the point where they settle it in their heart. And the doubts are removed. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, this again, this is the turning point in Mark's gospel. And one of the greatest moments in history. But I want you to see what happens next in verse 31 and verse 33. What does Jesus do in verse 31? He begins to teach them about the things he must suffer. And look at verse 32. And he spake and saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Boy, he went from a real high to a real low here. I mean, that's the character of Peter, isn't it? One day he's walking on water. The next time he's sinking. The next moment, one minute he has a sword in his hand ready to defend Jesus. The next minute he is denying him. And here he makes this great confession only followed by this little blunder here. He still didn't fully understand. And in some sense that Jesus had to go to the cross. He had to go to the cross. And that is the essence of spiritual growth. Some things we get, other things we're just learning. We're just getting it. And so... However, he did get it right. He did make the right statement, but he was learning and growing into who Jesus was. Finally, let me give you the last picture. The last picture. We saw defiance. Some see Jesus like the Pharisees, doubt. Some see Jesus like the disciples, deliberation. Some people see Jesus like ordinary people, development. Some see Jesus like the blind man who was healed, but then dedication. Some see Jesus like people who die to self. Now, you might ask this question. How do I know that I'm seeing Jesus properly? And the answer is very simple. If you see Jesus properly, you will do the things that he will ask you to do. And what is he asking? Look in verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. This is how you know that you see Jesus properly, because if you see him for who he is, what you will be willing to do is pick up your cross and follow Christ. You will, de you will deny yourself. You will die to self. You'll have a life of self-denial. And that doesn't mean that we deny the pleasures that God has given us. It just means that we don't put our will ahead of, his, ahead of his will. We die to our own desires, our own uh, will, and we submit ourselves to God. That's what it means to pick up the cross. The cross was an instrument of, of uh, death. It was capital punishment. And so the bottom line is this, that... If you really see Jesus for who he is, it's going to cause a radical change in your life. You will put Christ first. You will walk in his ways. You will pick up your cross. You will follow Christ. You will deny your own life for the sake of the gospel. Because it says in verse 37, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Look at verse 36 rather, but... But what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You will gladly lose your life for Christ if you see him just the way he is. And so the question is, is that the way you see him? Let me close today by just reading this one quote. This is from a man by the name of Howard Guinness. He was a man who saw Jesus properly. He was a man who was a medical student. He accepted an invitation to go to Canada from the United Kingdom just after graduation. He really bought a one-way ticket to the, uh, proclaim the gospel to this university and to other campuses throughout the world. He just really gave up his medical career to share the gospel. And he wrote a little book in 1939. He called it Sacrifice. And in it, he asked this question. Listen to what he says. 
Where are the young men and women of this generation who, are, who will hold their lives cheap and be faithful even unto death? Where are they who will lose their lives for Christ, flinging them away for love of him? Where are those who will live dangerously and be recklessly in his service? Where are the men of prayer? Where are the men who count God's word of more importance to them than their daily food? Where are the men who, like Moses of old, commune with God face to face as a man speaks with his friend? Where are God's men in this day? It's a good question. It's a good question. Oh, that we would see Jesus properly. That we would see him for who he is because it is a matter of life and death. Let's bow for prayer together today. Let's bow for prayer. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll use this word to challenge hearts. May we examine ourselves with this one question that the text demands of us. Who do you say the Son of Man is? How do you see Jesus? Father, may we all come to grips with that one question. And for those who are still doubting or deliberating or even defiant, I pray that, Lord, you'll break through that stubbornness, that dimness in their own spiritual vision and reveal yourself and show them, Lord, that you are the Christ. And may it lead to them picking up the cross and following you, following you in a life of total dedication. May we see Jesus for who he is. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, friend, I just want to ask you, I want you to, would you be willing right now to examine your own heart and be honest with yourself? And would you be willing to pray right now if you've never trusted Christ, if you've never really truly called upon him as your Lord and your Savior, as the Christ, would you be willing to do that today, friend? Would you be willing just to pray this prayer? Say, Lord Jesus, I know that, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the crucified, risen Savior. And today I surrender my will to you. I put my faith in you. I Forgive me for my stubborn resistance. Today I trust you as Lord and Savior. Friend, if you pray that and mean it in your heart, he will save you. He will make you his child. And the response that you should have after that is to pick up your cross and follow him. May you do that. Father, bless these words to hearing hearts today. We pray in Jesus' wonderful, matchless name. Amen.